In one way or another, the work that I've done over the last 30 years really has addressed the issue of the paradox of racism in the United States when that nation was formed under the principle of human equality. How is it that you know, this nation that commits to these egalitarian values continued from the 50s into the 60s and the 70s and 80s when I came on the scene to have this seeming perpetuation of discrimination and, and negative bias. And that's really where things were when I came on the scene. There were really interesting reviews of the literature that demonstrated that Americans, by and large, were renouncing prejudice, at least on surveys, explicit self-report measures. They said, yeah, no, I don't think that prejudice is good. I'm renouncing prejudice. And yet, when you looked at what they did and how people behaved, and there's a beautiful review by Faye Crosby and her colleagues in 1980 that was pivotal in my thinking about these issues, in which she looked at uh, sort of everyday behavior. She looked at eye contact. She looked at interpersonal distance. She looked at um, or, uh, uh, um, uh, speech errors, okay, uh, these kind of speech disfluencies that were more prevalent when white Americans interacted with blacks than when they interacted with other white Americans. And the question was, how do you make sense of that issue? Well, for Faye Crosby and many like her, they said, despite the fact that people report being non-prejudiced on self-report measures, uh, they are more prejudiced than they're willing to admit. Her formal quote is, they're more prejudiced than they're willing to admit. And I was frustrated by that statement in 1983, I think is when I read the article, 1984. And I said, it can't be that easy, that there is a struggle that a lot of people experience in trying to overcome prejudice, or so I thought. And it didn't seem to match her conclusion, didn't seem to match my observations of the way in which people reacted, many of them anyway, when they responded with prejudice. And that was the puzzle that I set out early on in my career to try to address. How is it that people could renounce prejudice and yet respond in biased ways? And so I developed, and I'm not going to go into the details of this now, because if I tell you everything, it'll, we'll be here for hours, unless you would like to be here for hours. <laughs> But I developed a theory that would help us to understand how it is within a single individual, you could both renounce prejudice and still be vulnerable to responses that are inconsistent with those values. Stereotypic thoughts that, uh, that pop to mind, uncomfortable feelings when you interact with people who are different from you. And basically what I argued is that those uh, stereotypic thoughts, those spontaneous feelings that you have, they're sort of automatic, unintentional. believe are their values, truly believe are their beliefs. And the question becomes, how do you actually uh, address that set of circumstances? And most of my work over time really tried to look at that set of issues. That is, if I really, really, really care about being non-prejudiced, it's important to my self-concept, part of my value system, and yet I think in stereotypic ways, oh, that black person must be lazy, or whatever the stereotypic thought may be, that should be a threatening set of circumstances. And Pam noted that I study guilt. Right? Well, I study guilt in response to a violation of a personal moral code, a value that tells me that's a wrong way to think. What I want to focus on today really is the, the following set of circumstances, which really took the um, field by storm. So I should note that the title of the talk is Breaking the Prejudice Habit, Creating Long-Term Change. All right? And I want to talk about prejudice as a habit, You'll see that come through. And I want to talk what creating long-term change really means. So this notion that people might have unintentional bias uh, 
that, that could be at odds with their values is, is a problem that people are focused on quite intently in the stereotyping and prejudice literature. And indeed, uh, major theorists, Susan Fisk among others, have basically implicated these kind of implicit, automatic, unintentional biases as a major culprit in the perpetuation of discrimination. Even though people don't intend it, these biases, biases persist, and they seem to play a role in uh, perpetuating racial disparities and discrimination. Now, Susan isn't alone. There are august bodies like the National Science Foundation, the National Academies of Science, who have been throwing their force behind uh, this issue and encouraging people to try to take steps to figure out how to eliminate these biases. If these biases are, in fact, responsible for the perpetuation of discrimination, then we should take this problem seriously and and we should try to find ways to mitigate the bias, try to eliminate the bias. If the bias didn't exist, then presumably there wouldn't be discriminatory outcomes. So you'll see that there's been this clarion call across scientists, across practitioners, uh, to try to develop ways to mitigate or otherwise reduce these types of implicit biases. And in the last decade or so, there have been widespread efforts to develop interventions to try to reduce implicit bias. Now, there are now uh, 400 or so studies that have tried to directly address uh, implicit bias. The vast majority of them have some features in common. Most typically, they are one-shot, single-session studies. All right? So people come into the lab, you do some type of intervention, and you measure implicit bias. You do some type of intervention, you measure implicit bias again, and you see if it worked. Second characteristic is that the task is done at the behest of the experimenter. So you come in and you're told to do a task, but you are not really told why you're doing the task. And so I'll give you a couple of examples in just a moment. You're just told, do this task, do it for 30 minutes, and then you're going to do another task. So you're told there's sort of a series of unrelated tasks. Notice what you're not doing. You're not inviting them into the problem to work on reducing prejudice. They don't even know that that's the goal of these uh, strategies. The interventions tend to target implicit bias directly. And again, I'll give you an example, I'll just give you the overarching features now. And the reductions if in implicit bias, if they are observed, are incidental to the task. back to is a model of the self by Milton Rokich, who was an important theorist in the 1960s and 70s in social psychology. And what he was really interested in is how knowledge is organized within a self-system, hierarchically organized within a self-system. Now at the top of the hierarchy is the self. Things that are close to the self uh, are uh, central to the self. You'll see at the, as we move from the bottom to the top, we're seeing increased centrality to the self, are things like our values, our self-concept, right? Things that are really important to us. And things that stem from our values are our motivations, the things that try to guide our behavior over time. And they tend to be our thoughtful uh, reflections of the kind of person that we think we should be or want to be, for example. A little bit down uh, further in the higher, oh, and here we might think about values to be not prejudiced, OK? That might lead to motivation to respond without prejudice. A little bit further down in the hierarchy is our knowledge, OK? And awareness about events in the world. Okay, and what we have in, applied to the context of prejudice, the key things that we're concerned with is our knowledge and awareness about discrimination in the world. I mean, how aware are we that discrimination exists and might be a serious social problem, and how aware are we that we might be biased ourselves in our own behavior? So both of those things likely vary on a continuum, and how aware someone is is likely to be critical to whether they're going to put effort into overcoming any type of bias that they might have. Further down in the hierarchy, lower in centrality, are these kinds of 
automatic associations, the stereotypic ones, the, the, the feelings that kind of spontaneously pop to mind when people come in contact with uh, people from different groups. Now, all three of these, and this is granted an oversimplified model, okay, but all three levels in the hierarchy can influence behavior. So that's very important, but what are the conditions under which they will influence behavior? Now keep in mind, the self doesn't exist in a vacuum. The self exists within society, right? And of course there's lots of other layers, all right? But I'm, again, in this oversimplified model, I just wanna get some points across. If we go down the, val the, the uh, levels in the hierarchy, we might think about at the same level of values, there could be social norms. And we know there's a lot of pressure. I mean, that's what was going on in Faye Crosby's review. She said people said it was socially unacceptable to be prejudiced, and so people said they would say they were not prejudiced, right? I think social norms do influence people, and it may influence people at the level of uh, the, these kinds of values. But I also want to point out that there are some ways in which society is organized that may make people relatively unaware of discrimination or their role in perpetuating discrimination. What do I have in mind? Well, in the United States anyway, there's sort of de facto segregation. I mean, whites and blacks are not always in a lot of contact. Think about the implication that has for your knowledge about discrimination in the world. I mean, they. Our, our kids are learning in history books, we waved the magic legislative wand in 1964 and discrimination went away. Martin Luther King was there and you know, Johnson had the Civil Rights Act and we just legislated away. So discrimination doesn't exist. In their daily life, they're not necessarily seeing it, sometimes protecting themselves from it, okay? Uh, and, and so they may not be fully aware of discrimination as a serious social problem. Because there is this kind of de facto uh, segregation, they may also not be aware that they can contribute to the problem. They may not be aware of their own biases because they only may be triggered when you come in contact with people from different groups. And so this de facto segregation may place constraints on people's awareness that prejudice is a problem serious social problem and that I might be, however unwittingly, complicit in the perpetuation of the problem. Is that clear? Okay. Now with automatic associations, <coughs> one of the things that we uh, also see is that there are subtle and pervasive stereotypic mes messages that permeate our social fabric. All you have to do is watch TV, pick up a magazine, talk to people, and you're going to find confirmation after confirmation after confirmation of these kind of stereotypic images. And so those kinds of processes actually contribute to the continuation of these types of implicit biases. So now as a person interested in promoting change, my question for you is, where do you do your work? Where would you try to intervene? The literature so far has been choosing here. That's where they've located the problem. They said that's where we should intervene. And I'm going to argue that directly changing associations will likely be ineffective in, ineffective in the long term. Why? Because these associations very often are supported by things higher in the hierarchy. I don't think discrimination is a problem or I uh, you know, don't have values that propel me to try to overcome bias. And they can be supported by things lower in the hierarchy like these subtle and pervasive messages that seem to reinforce our stereotypic uh, uh, way of thinking, these automatic associations. So I actually think that just going directly for those associations doesn't really have a chance in the long run to promote lasting long-term change. <coughs> what about if we targeted this level? I think if you change values, that's a starting point, but values are really hard to change. People don't like change. Okay, they need to see a reason to change and we could give our best persuasive communication to people about why prejudice is wrong and why they should change and social psychologists among us, what do people say? No. <laughs> I'm just giving you the answer, all right? No, they resist change, right? A lot of times they tune you out they discredit the source. There's all kinds of motivated processes that might leave their prejudices intact, despite the fact that it was a strong, compelling, forceful, well-reasoned, uh, well-supported argument. 
we tend to be flexible and we can deny evidence when it suits our needs, right? So I think that changing values turns out to be hard. We like to justify both our system in the world and our cognitive system, and that makes change hard. And what I'm going to argue is that perhaps we would have some leverage for promoting change if we worked in the middle of this hierarchy. Again, building on Rokic's theorizing, the idea here that perhaps awareness could be changed given the correct opportunities. All right, and that's really what I'm interested in trying to do. Trying to challenge uh, their notion in their de facto segregation uh, or convince them that discrimination is a serious problem in the world and help them to understand the way in which they may be contributing to the bias. What I'm interested in is trying to figure out how to promote long-term change within individuals uh, as a way to try to combat bias, try to take small steps perhaps forward to, to, to mitigate this problem. So I want to highlight uh, in inducing long-term change, there are some considerations that we want to, uh, to, to think about. Um, in this context, what I'd like to suggest is that rather than changing implicit bias directly, as the vast majority of the literature has done, uh, even to try to change implicit bias, <coughs> we might be better off trying to change the way the self-regulatory system engages with the environment. All right? And I'm going to argue awareness, as I've defined it, within this self-system is the lever for self-regulatory change. One of the things that I noticed as I did my, uh, as I've done my research over the last many years is that even people um, who are motivated to overcome bias, they often don't really fully understand the challenge involved in overcoming prejudice. They think being motivated is enough. And in fact, the, perpetuate, or the persistence of implicit biases against changes in those beliefs is not sufficient. So people are going to need to be aware, made aware somehow, that they may actually uh, possess implicit bias. All right, And that's going to be part of what we, we look at. People would need to understand <coughs> why bias persists and why uh, the, the um, bias may not reflect their values. What I've talked about in a lot of my research is that these spontaneous un, um, unintentional biases are kind of habitual. And so I've conceptualized prejudice within the self as, as a habit. And another thing people would need to understand is that implicit biases are consequential. They actually affect how you be behave. They may affect the eye contact that you make, the interpersonal distance that you establish, the judgments you make about others. And there's accumulating evidence uh, that, that implicit biases can affect a wide range of outcomes <clears throat> from these everyday interactions to things like who gets a life-saving treatment in an emergency room for a thrombosis. All right, so everything from the mundane to the truly consequential. And so I think that what we have to help people to understand is that these implicit unintentional biases are consequential. But that's not going to be enough. I mean, you could be aware, right? You could understand the problem, but then you're going to need strategies that will help people to reduce unintentional bias or break the link between the associations and discrimination. One of the ways in which this became patently obvious to me, this strategy component that was going to have to be key to any intervention, is when I was talking to um, reporters, people would identify me as the prejudice reduction expert within psychology, all right? Uh, and uh, I would be talking to reporters, and they would say, all right, so what do we know? And I said, well, there are a lot of people who are sincerely motivated to overcome prejudice. They go, oh, that's nice. So what can I tell them to do? I said, well, when they violate their uh, standards, they actually, they're, they're guilty. They go, OK, so what do they do? And I said, well, they get really motivated, and they look for what went wrong. And I started to hear I really wasn't answering the question. Right? I wasn't talking about strategies that people could use. And I heard the hollowness of my own words. And it really changed the direction of what I felt I needed to be working on, which is this uh, intervention work. And so one of the things that we'd like to be able to do is to identify tools that might assist people in their efforts to overcome bias and help them to understand 
and this I was confident about from early in my work, is that there was going to be need for people to work at this. It wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't going to be undone overnight. And it was going to take some time. That prejudice is not a habit that is necessarily easily broken, but is going to require uh, sustained effort over time. So let me tell you a little bit about the prejudice habit-breaking intervention that we developed. Uh, it's a very straightforward uh, type of approach where we had a self-paced interactive uh, slideshow that was designed to promote personal awareness. And you're going to see the way in which we did that was to have people take the implicit association test and give them feedback on the strength of their implicit bias, the level of their implicit bias, and to promote societal awareness of the problem of discrimination. And so part of that interactive slideshow is going to be explaining to them not only what implicit bias is, how it's measured, how it works, but how it actually is linked to discriminatory outcomes. To try to create the notion that, in fact, there is this problem out there, and I may be again, however unwittingly contributing to it. These two things together, we think, will create concern about discrimination as a social problem. And you'll see that's one of the outcomes that we want to measure. And then we want to share with them five different strategies that if they took and exported into their everyday lives, worked at, practiced, that that would help them to overcome this kind of prejudice habit. Now, the strategies that we identified were the things that were there in the literature. But we're going to try to approach this a little bit differently. We're not going to have to say, just do these because we want you to do them. We're going to explain that these strategies will help those who are motivated and want to overcome bias. It's a personal goal that they're embracing to break the prejudice habit. So we're going to use these types of uh, strategies. One is called stereotype replacement from Margot Monteith's work. Very straightforwardly, every time you have noticed that you have a stereotypic thought, first of all, you've got to become mindful that you might have those thoughts. Get in touch with them. Be attuned to them. And when you have them, essentially undo them. Replace it with a non-stereotypic thought, with an egalitarian thought. So if you think a black person was lazy, notice that was a stereotypic thought. Say, I shouldn't do that. I should think a different way. Counter-stereotypic imaging. I mean, a lot of times you could think about uh, black people and have stereotypic thoughts, but you could also take some time to just think carefully about counter-stereotypic people, Barack Obama. Oprah Winfrey, uh, people you know personally who don't fit the stereotype. Say, take some time thinking about that. Irene Blair showed in some really nice work in a short-term study that if you take some time thinking about that, it'll help to mitigate that bias, at least in the short term. All right? But can you intentionally deploy these strategies is the question. Once you see it could be in the service of a long-term goal. Individuating, this is a classic technique that social psychologists talk about. What's the problem of stereotyping but jumping to dispositional conclusions based on stereotypes? information. Instead, what you could do is to say, oh, what is this person like? Learn more information. Get individuating information. And the idea here is the more individuating information you would get, the less, less likely you would be to uh, use stereotypes. Perspective taking, I already mentioned that earlier, has been demonstrated in the short term again to show reductions in implicit bias. And then increasing opportunities for contact. What we end up telling them in this uh, slideshow is that if they take some time to seek out opportunities for contact, actually get to know people, that that could help to mitigate the bias. Another thing that we tell them in here is although we give them five different strategies, they're not fully independent. Right? They could have overlapping, interactive kinds of effects. That is, if you have opportunities for contact, that could help you to individuate. It could help you to do perspective taking. It could fuel the importance of doing stereotype replacement, and so on and so on. So we present these strategies as a toolkit that would help them to mitigate or otherwise uh, overcome the bias. So let me try to wrap up, because I've had you much too long. Um, the, the habit-breaking intervention that I've shared with you instigates a self-regulatory process that promotes awareness, concern, and reduces bias. And this is at the individual level. And I'm going to argue this is a good starting point for people to overcome prejudice. 
One of the things I'll share with you but not go into detail is that we've now demonstrated the efficacy of this kind of intervention for combating bias in other groups. For example, we did an, uh, a study with faculty in the STEM disciplines at the on the University of Wisconsin campus where we gave them a two and a half hour workshop where we went through all of these kinds of issues and we were able to show that it made them more tuned into their bias more efficacious in overcoming bias and actually improve the overall climate in the department, which uh, we're now doing yet another follow-up study two years later with them. Uh, the process involves realizing the connection between one's own behavior and societal discrimination. I think that that's critical because if you don't link your uh, own behavior with societal discrimination, it's not going to be as powerful. Concern about discrimination, everybody's really focused on implicit bias. I'd like to shift the focus a little bit to this variable about concern uh, uh, over discrimination. I think that that turns out to be a critically important lever part of the awareness that, that uh, encourages people to uh, sustain their efforts. And I would argue the change is long lasting. We're seeing it on a variety of self-report measures. We're seeing it on behavior. And I think that what this research does, which the, the strategies that focus specifically on implicit bias, target those associations directly, don't do is it demonstrates the power of the conscious mind to intentionally de deploy strategies to reduce bias. And you've got to work at it. It's not something that's going to be done overnight. And I think it raises the hope of resolving the paradox that I started my uh, presentation with, the paradox of discrimination founded on the principle of human equality. I remember one striking thing. Phyllis Katz wrote in an article, it was published in 1976, but I'll, I'll never forget it when I was thinking about the development of, of bias and how entrenched these things are. Uh, when a little girl said to her, mother seeing another little girl who was black being pushed in a stroller. Look, mommy, there's a black baby maid. Now, this was reflective of a different time, right? So we're talking, this was published in 76, so the observations were made in the early 60s, you know, that kind of stuff. But they're picking up those kinds of messages. And so the question is, can we prevent the elaboration of noticing difference? Like, I would never advocate, for example, that we should have a colorblind society. A, it's not possible, and B, it's not really desirable, right? I mean, because a lot of people really uh, like their group memberships. <laughs> they der derive a sense of self from them and esteem and so on. And, and the question is, can you prevent the elaboration of what is different is bad? What is different, particularly in this case, what is black is negative. I think that that's what, with the little kids, if we could focus on that. We still need to work on these older people because now they come to college, you know, in Wisconsin, very liberal campus, right? A lot of generally well-intentioned kids Kids, but they don't have the tools to work with this stuff. Many of them, the de facto segregation. Uh, Tony Austin, who's a co-author on the first paper, he came from Wauwatosa in Wisconsin, which is very, very white. He had never seen a black person. And so then he came to campus, he said, wow, this place is diverse. And I'm going, where are you? You know, I mean, but he, he was seeing at least some people who were different. And for the very, he thought he was, not biased, and he felt, I mean, he you know, felt those stereotypes, and he felt really uncomfortable, and he was in a class of mine. That's where this first project came from. You know, there was talking to the reporters, but there was Tony Austin, who was a student in my class, who was battling his own sort of internal dynamic, where he was noticing his own bias, and he didn't know what to do about it. He knew it was wrong, he felt terribly guilty, but he didn't have the tools, and the tools are what are essential. Uh, I, I would say that, I'm going to give you two answers, okay? You know, one is I think if you were to take this and just make it part of your life, you know, that, that inside the classroom, outside the classroom, create a mindfulness about these things, that, that uh, it, it is that awareness that something needs to be done and to be sensitive to these issues. The problem for those who are stigmatized by bias is that there's the, the um, sphere of stereotype threat, right? That threat in the air, that others are thinking about me as a member of my group and not as an individual. And so we want to try to mitigate those types of things and change the group dynamic rather than just giving minority group members uh, an affirmation which um, Jeff Cohen and Greg Walton have shown, if they affirm their identities, <coughs> it protects them against the threat 
that others might be biased against them. But they can't do it alone. It really has to be a kind of in tandem thing. But I think that you know, using these kinds of strategies, creating that mindfulness would enable people to then approach the situation with a bit more openness. Thank you. Okay.